I appreciate being here this critical time in our history. And each time I sit and think, meditate, and think I've got the subject, and focus, another subject comes in focus that makes me want to stand again and speak still again. And you wonder, where will it end? I am a person consistently at war. And when you are consistently at war, you need an abode of peace. You need something to retreat within yes. Yes. that will give you the peace to go back to the battlefield. Peace. And sometimes, thinking over how I've spent my life and the fact that I could have done it otherwise, My peace within the wall came when I recognized I will never know peace. Because I will never get out of the wall. And that for an activist in a liberation movement, war is normal. Peace is ad abnormal until the war is won. My mental notes for this morning is about the serious business of being serious. And oppressed people realizing the nature of their oppression and not being able to face it frontally generally began to fantasize and create a world for themselves that is unreal while the real world marches on and sometimes leaves them behind. People, like objects, sometimes become obsolete because they didn't keep up with the age in which they live. At this critical time in my personal history, trying to hold what's left of my family together trying to communicate with my extended family that sometimes is just as dependable as what's left of my natural family in the midst of all of this and looking at the world marching forward and being a teacher of history I know that we are psychologically, culturally, financially, and politically out of step with history because we are out of step with reality. We cannot continue to live fantasy. Now I'm going to look at certain things recent things and explain the nature of the fantasy and the desired reality. I have many faults that I'm perfectly willing to admit and one is a low toleration for people who do not read books. 
books have been, have been my salvation, my rescue, my spiritual abode to the extent that it's inconceivable to me that there are people who don't read those objective core books. Now, I begin with the Harlem event of last Tuesday. Then I'm going to work back and forth across history to show you how we are continually missing the point. Last Tuesday, there was an event in Harlem publicized as being for Winnie Mandela. It wasn't about Winnie Mandela at all. It was a charade and a local con game pulled in the name of Winnie Mandela to get an audience. And in every true sense, it was an offense to Winnie Mandela. And yet the place was packed. The people were there. And when she finally arrived, we were told that it wasn't about Winnie Mandela. It was about Queen Mother Moore passing her lifeline over to Winnie Mandela, as though that's possible. See? Now, to say something against Queen Mother Moore is like saying something against an icon. Now, I'm wondering why other people have lived through the same period as I have lived through, know some of the same fakeries that I know. Why do I always bell the cat, take the bunt, and identify the fakery? But others know the same fakery and kept quiet. I'm still taking the flat for being the first one to say that the so-called Million Man March was a con game and a method of washing the ego of Louis Farrakhan and that nothing would be achieved that could not have been achieved without a march. I'm still getting hate mail from my own people threatening my very existence. People who've been friends of mine for 30 years have broken off relationship with me the man's crazy. He's against everything. I'm not against everything. I'm against truth. I'm, I'm against a lie. I'm for truth. Now, let's deal with this event. Finally, when Winnie Mandela entered, she told them she wasn't feeling well. They continued the ceremony. They continued all of this adoration a queen mother. Now, I'm going to sit silent. Now, I've lived in this, this city since, I mean, of New York City since 1933. I came here as an 18-year-old teenager. I know Queen Mother Moore for nearly 40 years before they called her Queen Mother Moore. Her name is Audley Moore. She was active in the American Communist Party. There are internal black parties within, I mean, clubs within the party. She manu always maneuvered herself into being the treasurer. <laughs> and took good care of herself. Now, if a whole lot of people know this, now I'm going to get some more enemies by saying what is true. Queen Mother Moore is a piece of fiction created in Harlem. She is a Louisiana Creole 
For most of our lives, she didn't even speak to black people. She must have gotten a dozen trips to Africa. I'm the queen of the race. So why don't he just keep quiet, let her run her hustle after all of you? <laughs> But the truth about the matter, right now, she's not running the house, so somebody else is running it and making a living yeah. off of her yeah. running the house. Right. Taking up funds, well, the queen mother want to make her. still another trip to Africa. African nations give money, other sympathizers give money. She's had a number of husbands, none of them black. <laughs> now look, if you are to get serious about our freedom movement, you've got to know the players in the game. Then you've got to know the jokers in the game. I'm not against her. I have worked with her. She has some land upstate. She's going to call Mount Addis Ababa and build a university there. And I was going to be uh, president of a university of some land that <laughs> had no buildings. <laughs> and when I finally visit the land, and not even a decent privy. Now, people move based on symbols. Yes. We created symbols to make the least use of them. The symbol on your money, the symbol on so much that you think started some other place, started with us. So they're using a symbol to get a whole lot of people together to have a ceremony it has no definite meaning in our life right now because we engage in so much ceremony without substance. And we have not been able to ask leader a simple question. Leader, where are you leading me? And because we have not been able to ask that question, we have not created the kind of leaders that we need. Well, all right, now, everybody's waiting for Winnie Mandela to speak. All the ceremony goes on and on and on and on. The woman told you she's not feeling well. If she's going to speak, let her speak so she can go to a hotel and rest. I wish she had a heart attack before she left South Africa. No, another is taking into consideration. Everybody's going through all kinds of ceremonies. Oh, yeah. wow. Then finally, they let us say a few words. And on her way to the door, somebody got to pray again for her. Somebody got to give her flowers. They could have given her all the time she was sitting there waiting to speak. But nobody, but nobody have examined South Africa in its struggle and her relationship to that struggle. In all the years her husband was in jail. They have not examined the tragedy of the recent separation. And they have not understood that when people play a role in our liberation, similar to Winnie Mandela and Nelson Mandela, they should not even when they separate, have any public display of it. If we go back to the African system, the elders right. 
would gather them in a closed room. I don't mean they make them stay together. But the reason for them separating would never become common gossip. Because when people have played that role in your liberation, you respect them enough not to start rumors and silliness. Winnie Mandela is a human being. And at her age now, she's still a very physically attractive human being. All the years when Nelson Mandela was in jail, let us understand one thing. She was in the heart of that liberation movement, went to jail, suffered, went into house arrest. When you go through all of this without a husband and raising two children, because you are a human being with human endurance, you need somebody to confide in. You need somebody's shoulder to lean on and shed a tear. Else you lose command of yourself. Nelson Mandela, a human being. In jail, he found not only an outlet, but a way to organize other prisoners and to occupy his own mind, even studying rock formation. Now, with all of this, these two human beings under pressure of a fascist government that you have not studied. People talk about South Africa, not read one single book on it, no time. It may be unfortunate, unfortunate that I'm not going to become a dictator. Because I believe that there are certain things in the world either have to be dictated or they don't exist. Everybody that go to Africa, so far as I'm concerned, would have to read three books and explain them before they can go. No passport. <laughs> no visa. No nothing. And people who cop out on that blackness, people like Roy Innes, I would have certain mornings when I would have executions. <laughs> they would be executed before they have their breakfast while watching me eat my breakfast. Because <laughs> I'm tired of nonsense. And I'm tired of ceremony without substance. Now let's hang into this, what we're talking about. We're talking about two people in South Africa in the midst of a struggle. Now, in the midst of this struggle, when you're paying attention to this struggle, you have to remember that people who've been associated with over 50 years. And when the McCarthy period was driving black writers and so-called leftists and activists to cry and to weep and to confess on their friends. I wouldn't let it happen to me, but what did I do? I took a minor job at NBC at night. Night supervisor of maintenance in one of their uptown studios. High sounding job. Nothing but a damn photo. <laughs> Supervising some other photos. <laughs> and because I supervised them so well, and they got all the offices cleaned and there was no complaints, they were paid for seven hours. They finished in four and went home and held down a job in the day and 
together, family, sent the kids, paid a little mortgage, every so long, no, no complaints. You know, so I'm all right, and I, I have to be there, whether they're there or not. And what did I do? I mean, after they're gone, I'm got all the NBC t uh, telephones available to me. I can call all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> I called my friend Eastern Udom in Nigeria in the middle of the night. No, oh, what the hell is wrong with you? Crazy enough. <laughs> so I got a free phone. <laughs> so I use it. Now, what I'm trying to focus in on the situation that produced a Nelson Mandela in the situation that produced a Winnie Mandela. I said long before, even as much as two years before he was released, if there was a betting contest about who would be run for president of South Africa, my bet is on Winnie Mandela. Now why? Why did I say Winnie Mandela instead of Nelson Mandela? Because I know in 27 years in jail, living under a fascist government, they've got time to play games with your mind that you cannot control. And so let's look at him. Not as a cop out. Not as the president of a country. But as a compromise, waiting for the real revolution to occur, a holding action. Now let's look at Winnie, a nationalist who realized the one thing that you're going to have to realize if you bring off a revolution, you've got to have the land back. For land is the basis of nation. Without land, no nation. She said she can't get what she wants. Take a gun and go back to the bush. That's revolutionary. Now, you have a commission in South Africa looking into past atrocities. And you got people confessing to past atrocities with the agreement that they will go scotch free. What other people in human history treat their enemies in that way? When they catch them, they kill them or drive them out or bury them. And yet we of all people where the greatest atrocity has been committed were asked to forgive you take one of the great moral leaders of the 20th century, Bishop Tutu, to head the, the commission. You mean to tell me you're going to forgive Sharpville? You're going to forgive Soweto? You're going to forgive the bulldozing of the homes, the whole villages of, of African people in a land that was theirs? Is that the guest has turned on them? You gonna forgive the death of Stephen Biko? Right. All of this gonna be put behind you by some damn commission? We supposed to be better than any people in the world, but our great spirituality, we gonna forgive. I grieve today over the death of my mother because she died of a disease that was unnecessary. People don't even die of it anymore. Called pellagra. Pellagra is a diet deficiency. All she had to do to cure herself is to eat. Now as a kid, seven and eight, or less than that, I noticed my mother serving everybody, making sure everybody got a nigga. You got a little more, you got a little more. And she, what's left in the pot, she'll take that and she never sit down. 
I did not know she was killing herself. And I go to the hospital and stinking wooden Jim Crow hospital. I hate hospitals to this day. She asked for a drink of water. I tried to get it for her. And a white nurse told me, boy, you don't work here. She'll get water when I say she. She was boss of the black nurses who wouldn't give her a drink of water. Do you think I will forgive the society that killed my mother? Then how can I be asked to give and how can I expect South Africans who suffered more to forgive? Let's be real. All of this talk about African liberation, all the libations and the ceremony, it don't mean nothing unless you are willing to work for the liberation of African people that to work for the liberation of African people, you've got to be serious. You've got to be able to face the truth. <laughs> and how can you help South Africa when you don't even know what you are helping? You don't know the whites there. You don't know the blacks there. Or during this MacArthur period, I'm working at NBC at night. I'm reading South African history in the day. I'm writing a whole a book on resistance movements in Africa, especially so South African resistance movements. I'm reading all the books of competence written on South Africa, how the boys got there. And you're not going to understand South Africa until you understand the boys. You've got to understand the boys are Calvinists. You got to understand the Calvinist branch of the Christ, of Christianity, because the Calvinists said that they are ordained by God to rule over lesser breeds, and so when they created apartheid in the atrocities of African people, they did this in the name of God. Now, take the people, the Arabs who killed those people at a hotel in Egypt shouting, God is great. I'm saying the most atrocities ever committed against human beings in human history has been committed in the name of God. If you commit an act of murder in the name of God, then you are charging God with the approval of an ungodly act. And by affiliation, you are an atheist. Because you have made God ungodly by asking him to join you in the crimes you're committing against other people. Now you're not going to face South Africa by just being against the part high because the larger issue is European domination of the land. Now, slaves were taken out of West Africa. Slaves were taken out of North Africa through inner West Africa. The slave trade existed all along the coast of East Africa. And the Portuguese slave trade met the, met the Arab slave trade coming from the north. And a lot of these slaves went to Brazil and parts of, of South America. And the Arabs destroyed the matrilineal system for the patrilineal system, the lineage coming down through the male. Go to the marketplace in East Africa right now. Yes. Male dominated. Go to the marketplace in West Africa right now. Female dominated. Because the Africans who Islamize the Africans in West Africa do what part of the culture to leave alone. And the one part of the culture you'd better leave alone is the matrilineal system. The lineage comes down 
to the female side. Therefore, the king's son cannot be king, but the king's sister's son cannot be king. Now, what is the African intelligently done? He's cutting down on competition between the father and the son over the kingship. Because the, the, the son became an able assistant to the father because he knew that that is high as he's going to get. He will never be king. Because he's been ruled out. Otherwise, if he can be king and father keep living on and on and on, he might think of some dependable poison to get father out of the way. For he wants to be king. To understand this, you've got to understand African customs. To understand history, you have to understand customs, you have to understand folklore. You've got to understand something else. The rule of honor in warfare. The African did not hit you in the back. The two warriors would face each other and they step back 10 feet. They would give the opposing warrior the time to change his mind. And an African would never fight a coward. And all you wanted to, all you had to do now, I'm afraid. Nobody gets any mileage from fighting someone who's afraid against this man. This is why growing up and caddying at Fort Bend in Georgia for Eisenhower and Omar Bradley and I wasn't doing anything. So, hey Pee Wee, that was my nickname because I was so small. <laughs> Supervise the crap game. Yeah. <laughs> I said, I ain't betting nothing now. I'm super why did I get to supervise the crap game? No one could get a reputation beating me up. <laughs> if you are so bad for a reputation, you got to beat up little Pee Wee. <laughs> we know he does to your man. Because <laughs> a star child can take him over. <laughs> now, again, after I was in the army, I have a, I'm a sergeant major, I'm big cheese in the army, That's next to being an officer, you know. <laughs> and uh, I have to ship soldiers overseas and process them coming back. During that period, no soldier can go to town. None of your soldiers can go to town. The stationary group. So I pay, come payday to take you up Commerce Street and negotiate. So you can't let us do nothing. We, we start shooting crap. You, you, you tell us we're making too much noise. You supervise the game. Also, I supervise the game. End of the day, I got more money than anybody else. I ain't bet nothing. In town, I take a shiner to some girl who have birthdays every other month depending on what soul is listening. <coughs> so, so she had a birthday on me. So I'm renting some nightclub, giving a big duray for her. And came time to tip the waiter. I tipped him and almost begin to cry. My father, sharecropper, mill hand, part-time farmer, one week with all of this he made $18. And I counted the $18 and he lectured me, be persevere. If you work hard in this country, boy, you see what you can do? $18 in one week. 
giving a party for this girl who wasn't even a, wasn't a birthday anyway, but for him for that job. <laughs> I tipped the maitre d' more money than my father makes in three months. And why did I get all that excess money? Not persevering. Not working hard, not being honest. I had learned to be a little crook for the first time in my life. I got it cut in the cotton, crab game. <laughs> now that's real. See, so, too many times you get into fantasies and don't deal with real. Now let's deal with what's real in South Africa. The Boers came into South Africa to rule black. I am not here to give you equality. I am here to rule you. I am ordained by my God to rule over the lesser breeds. And I have declared that you are a lesser breed. Now this is the, this is the South Africa that Winnie Mandela and Nelson Mandela has to deal with. Now deal with the human pressure on both of them. Deal with the political pressure on both of them and deal with the mentality of both of them under these different pressures. Deal with people appealing to people for human consideration who have not accepted the humanity of African people before they arrive they arrived at the conclusion that they were going to rule over lesser breeds. And in studying the longest, the most consistent resistance movements in South, in Africa period, at night I'm studying these movements in, after the fellows have cleaned all the offices and go home. I'm sitting there on NBC time studying the struggle in South Africa and writing a whole book on it, book after book on resistance movements. Now, when Mandela come out of this 27 years without a husband, still in the struggle, don't you think we should pay enough respect for her not to get her involved in a Harlem Con game. But if you've never read a single book on the struggle, and if you're not part of her career for over 30 years as I have part of her career, two hours after Nelson Mandela went to jail, the information was on my desk at Freedom Ways Magazine, where I was one of the editors. I had kept so close in touch with the movement and corresponded with people in South Africa, and they corresponded with me, sent me pamphlets, information that nobody else had. And how did they do it? They would take a conservative South African paper, take out their guts, put the pamphlets and the information in the middle, then wrap the paper. When the South African Post clerk sees the paper, well, well, ain't no harm in sending that paper out of there. Let it go. And I would take the New York Times, take the guts out of it, and uh, put my material for South Africa inside, you know. Then when they see, well, this is the New York Times, well, they ain't nobody's harming, nobody's enemy. Let, let it come in. So I was corresponding with the activists in South Africa not long ago. So now I'm going to sit on stage. They asked me to introduce Winnie Mandela, and I thought she was going to start talking. And here's somebody running a con game doing an African ceremony all wrong. And she th sit there, told the people, I'm sick. I want to speak, go on. She heading up the aisle. More delay. I'm saying that we have to be real. 
but what we have to do in the world. There's a book called The Tribes. It deals with everybody in the world, all the major groups in the world, in their fight for a piece of space on the turf called the earth. Everybody's fight except ours. Asians willing to join the Europeans in taking over Africa. Everybody wants a piece of Africa, and the Africans are running from Africa. Look at the contradiction. Yet nobody has read, and I've yet to meet 10 people who read it. It's a long essay of William Leo Hansberry, Africa World's Richest Continent. Highest rainfall, greatest hydroelectric potential, in spite of several deserts, more fertile soil than any other spot on Earth. Sheikh Antadio continues this in a book called Africa, the Politics of a Federated State. He shows you that the river bottoms of Africa, proper, under proper cultivation, can not only feed Africa, but maybe one third of the world. Now I sailed down that big Congo River. There are parts when of that river that's a half a mile wide. All of that water is running to the sea. The sea don't need the extra water. Good engineering can hold that water inside of Africa and wipe out the deserts. Are you talking about nonsense? If you're going to prepare a people to rule a nation, then they've got to be prepared for everything in a nation, including the manufacture of the toilet paper. And when you talk nationhood, you've got to talk technology. If you can't control your rivers, you can't control your nation. You can't control your land, can't control your nation. Can't control your ideology. You can't control your nation. So don't shout nation time until you understand this. You shout nation time. Who's going to fly your aeroplanes? Who's going to manage your harbors? Who's going to negotiate for you in the international? you got goods over and above that you need. You can bargain on the market. I, I got something you need. You got something I need. We, we can have, have an exchange. The real strength of a nation is in its resources. And if you do not manage the wealth producing resources of your nation, you have no nation. And you are a fake when you think you're independent. There is not a nation in Africa where the African people manage the wealth producing resources in that country. There is not a nation in Africa that is politically free or economically free. Now that's real. Now, Basil Davison, one of the white writers who've done the most in telling the truth about modern Africa and how Europe still tends to keep it under its domination, have told us that what happened in Africa, what, what happened to our freedom movement. Now, I did a book called Who Betrayed the African World Revolution? What went wrong with the civil rights movement? What went wrong with the Caribbean Federation concept? What went wrong with the African independent movement? There have been so be many betrayals since then, I got to write the whole book over again. Because <laughs> you're copying out. When you, you, when you let your wealth producing resources go to the hand of other people, 
You are giving up nationhood. Now explain why is it before integration in that bag of worms you had at least a black grocery store every three blocks. Now you don't see one. It was no mystery for them to manage the store. Why do you have to have Koreans in that manager's store now? East Indian, Arabs. If you can't manage your community, you can't manage your nation. You rehearse for nationhood in your community. You rehearse for your community in your family. What did we lose in the process that we have to get back or be destroyed as a people, go out of business as a people. We stop talking to our children. We stop, there's a such thing called good manners. There's such thing as the proper thing to do. There are certain things in the family that is not negotiable. I mean, we don't discuss whether we forget this. Now, there was a time when if a man said something about your mother, even a coward would fight. He would, he'd rather fight and lose than not to have fought at all. Mother was dear. And, and the sister didn't come too far behind. We've forgotten all of this. We've forgotten curfew, the, the father, the authority figure in the home. He said, 11 o'clock, I want you in this house. And he didn't say 11.30. 11 o'clock, I was here. You don't negotiate with him. Master the situation. What we've lost is reality in that if, fa if a family has a structure, you can give a community a structure and subsequently a nation a structure. We are an unstructured people following other people who don't know where they are going. And if we ask the question, Leader, where are you leading me? You better get a good answer or replace the leader. Now haven't we followed enough people feathering their own lip, lining their own pockets? We haven't asked any questions. And when I began to ask some questions, I became a villain. They took up over $3 million in collection in the Million Man March. Why is it? 90% of those people were Christians. Why did the Muslims take up the collection and didn't account to anyone afterwards. And why did you let them get away with it? Because you dared not ask, leader, where are you leading me? Now, if over a million men march on Washington, if each one spend an average of a hundred dollars, look how much money you got just right there, and they, they did more than that. Plus the fact they paid ahead of time. 
They contributed additional money. There was enough money for six marches before the first march, before the march took place. Then why are they saying they got a deficit? I want to raise another million. And they've said that. You haven't asked any questions. What happened to the first? I'm a villain in my own community because people said, if you get a, can you get a million people to Washington? I'm not right or wrong whether I can get 10. <laughs> that don't make me wrong. Wanted to know what did you do with the million you took to Washington? And what is the aftermath? What you have not examined is the aftermath. What came after? When you go on a worldwide trip, an entourage of 30, a four motor airplane, a six man or woman crew, you have spent the same money taken up in Washington could have saved one of the predominantly black colleges. The same money for the trip could have built a chain of supermarkets throughout black America. Who was the trip supposed to serve? The closest person to a radical that he met in Africa was Winnie Mandela. Most of the others were cop-outs, compromised. Some were thugs with an army of thugs. Mobutu, who participated in the murder of Lumumba, one of the richest black men on the face of the earth. Some people in his country are starving one of the richest countries on the face of the earth. Why are they starving? In an African tradition, the ruler is not the owner of the wealth. The ruler is the guardian of the wealth. The role of the ruler is to make sure that things are distributed so everybody can have their share. Now, why nobody call into being African traditional governments? Why haven't somebody studied the African customary court? I have attended customary courts all over Africa. And I say that if I'm ever to be tried, I would prefer one of those courts to any civil court because the, before the African knew there was a civil court, they had more democratic justice than anything they had afterwards. And they didn't have one civil trained lawyer. What did they have? Respect for the idea that the elders had lived longer than they had lived and knew more. And their uncle could be in charge of that Supreme Court. We didn't lose all of this coming to America against our will. Because I can remember when there's serious problems in Georgia and Alabama, the first thing you try to do is to keep white folks out of it. And we would gather, and they would the older people would talk about it and straighten it out and call the young people concerned in and, and not, not ask them what they wanted to do. Tell them, this is what you are going to do. 
That was an internal family dictatorship. That was authoritarianism. But when we had that kind of authoritarianism, we had no drive-by shootings. We had no people putting poison in their veins. We were not the majority in the jails. Now, show me the this dictatorship through family custom was wrong. And as much as once you discarded it, yeah. you expose yourself for exploitation by everybody in the world, not just whites. East Asians too. East Asians have taken over the government of Guyana, former British Guyana, and Trinidad. How did the blacks let them do it? We are so democratic toward other people, we are undemocratic toward ourselves. <laughs> we should preserve these governments for our children still to come. Right. East Indians came in as farm labor, literally coolies been given privileges by the British and carefully waited their turn and took over the government because blacks were too kind, too kind to them. Now if you look at this catastrophe, look at the catastrophe in Trinidad, now look at the irony of it. Trinidad produced the three major pan-Africanist theoreticians. H. Sylvester Williams, C.L.R. James, and George Padmore. The same island that produced the whole concept of African reclamation and African unity couldn't find it in their will to unite the very island that produced the concept. There's something else even more tragic and terribly personal and maybe shouldn't be mentioned at all. Of the three major Pan-Africanists, <laughs> all three of them had children by black women, not one ever established a lasting relationship with one. If you're going to unite Africa, you're going to have to unite Africa in bed and out of bed. You've got to unite it symbolically. Because you cannot lead people back to Africa when the symbol of your mate is alien. The road back to Africa does not start between an alien woman's legs. What I'm saying is that in this regard both of us have some responsibility. It's not all the black man's responsibility. It's not all the black woman's responsibility. It's responsibility of both of you to realize this. And because white sociologists are saying that there's a war between the black man and the black woman, because white women live saying it, you feel called on to act out a war they created in their sick mind because they said it. Most of the time, you don't know what the hell are we arguing about? We got along before. Before we heard the story. But my point is that we have not faced reality and read enough to know the background to what is happening. 
When Farrakhan goes to Iran, do you think Farrakhan knows enough of African history to know that for 2,000 years before the first Europeans set foot in Africa, for 2,000 years the enemies of Africa came from Western Asia? And the last invasion of Africa came from Iran, 550 B.C. They were so brutal to Africans, the Africans cried out, Oh God, if you cannot send me a liberator, send me a conqueror who will show me mercy. Now, the little Macedonian, sometimes referred to as a Greek, called Alexander, didn't have to knock at Africa's door very hard for Africa, literally, let him in to show mercy. It's the first European occupation of Africa. This is 332 A.D. Now, everything that happened in Africa, B.C., Everything that happened in Africa before that was non-European and non-white. How can they build the pyramids in Africa when they had not built a shoe for themselves in Europe or a house for the window? It's a contradiction. Why do you give so much to other people before you give anything to yourself? Because if we discovered our role in history and read the proper books, even those written by white, enlightened whites who repudiated the bigger the Europeans, we would know that at this juncture in history, with books like the Bell Curve, the disuniting of America, assuming it was ever united, and now a book called Not Out of Africa, repudiating all Africa's claim. Africa can't claim Egypt. And Egypt is part of the Nile Valley that stretches 4,000 miles within the body of Africa. I can show you without any difficulty that Rome and Greece were not European creations. There was no Europe. Opposition to Rome and Greece created Europe. When they got together to protect themselves from Rome and Greece, the Franks became the French, the Huns became the Germans. Scattered warring tribes coming together to protect themselves against the Mediterranean force of Rome and Greece, and therefore becoming a state in the process. How can they, without even a state or an organized army, go all the way and organize Egypt when they hadn't even organized the parachute? We need to ask some serious questions about our understanding of history, but you've got to know more than history. You've got to know a comparative knowledge of history. You got to know something about European atrocities to other Europeans. Now, we made a lot to do about uh, there's half a million people killed in Uganda by Africans against Africans. Okay, Basil Davis has written an article explaining how the French set it up with the Belgians how the Belgians put the uh, Tutsis or Watutsis against the Hutus or Bahutus, installed a minority Africans over a, ma or a, ma over a majority. And so the big 
Hutus made the smaller Hutus their servants and treated them ruthlessly under Belgium rule. The war was a war of revenge set up by Europeans, not Africans. There was a time before this interference when the, if the Tutsis had a difference of opinion with the Hutus, would they send their warriors? No. They would send their dancers. Who wins the dance contest wins the war. And nobody got hurt. Give the loser a big banquet, let him go home. We didn't lose that in we didn't lose that in, in the United States. I remember in Gethsemane Baptist and when I was growing up there was only two denominations, Baptist and Methodist. The rest of the people were strange people. We didn't pay much attention to them. Anyway, I thought the Catholic was some kind of gypsies because of the long rope. So, I mean, the Baptists and the Methodists were the only denomination to be considered. You know, I mean, no frocktail minister came to our church. He wanted to make an announcement. He wanted to challenge our choir. Singing contest. Had about a female amen corner. Miss Elsie Would you dare come into a Baptist church and challenge us to out sing? And question whether we can out sing a method? And so he issued the challenge again. Save our pride and our honor. We gathered up our lead singers, wagon, went to this church. First we resented the fact that the church was called Bethel. How dare you Methodists call a church Bethel? That's a Baptist name. <laughs> Out of place even choosing a name for your church. More out of place even thinking that you can out sing our choir. <laughs> so we go to Bethel to discover that the same little minister had challenged about 12 other churches and 12 other choirs. <laughs> and we sang and we sang and we sang and we won, of course. But he took up enough money to burn his mortgage. And that was the reason in the first place. Then, because we had suspicious of Methodists, because they got sprinkled. So they couldn't possibly end up in beyond the pretty gates. But well, we had some toleration for them. They were at least human beings. <laughs> so after this singing contest, the method began to bring out more than a slight repast. The Romans didn't eat that well or cook that well. And we ate until we could almost fall. Sister Elsie said, and thanking them, you Methodists sure can cook even if you can't sing. <laughs> and so when we pass Methodist church and hear the bad singing, we bow and said, well, at least they can cook. And what's all of this to do with what I'm talking about based in reality about Africa? We didn't lose everything. Some of the customs carried over, 
for these customs, for African traditional customs of self-help. We never heard of the word adoption. We're taken in. Some woman would take him, some families, take in a child, they no mother, no father. Raised a man or a woman who had no, no papers, no nothing, no court, got nothing to do with it. Now we let the court take away children who shouldn't be taken away. Don't take away those who should be taken away because we have no community coordination. We've got no community coordination in understanding what is happening to us politically in the world. To understand what is happening to us politically is to realize no one came into Africa to do African people any good. I have no exception. You can be as Islamic as you want to. And why not? You created it. But you don't have to follow a bunch of fools and endorse the slave trade and turn your back. Or well, this go rampant. You have to prove everything. I'm saying once you look at what is happening and what has to happen, you've got to understand that there's a point where we missed the boat. We missed the boat because we did not become serious about serious things. So we had the civil rights movement and civil rights pimps, the anti-poverty movement, anti-poverty pimps, the black studies movement, black studies pimps. Once we learn to get these pimps out of our system and out of our life and face reality based on people who assume responsibility and we protect the people who assume responsibility. I am not an admirer of any form of totalitarianism that takes away the basic dignity of a human being. I am not an admirer of Adolf Hitler. Yet, if you read without prejudice, mind come. That is one of the finest documents on social organization that has been written. Read it without prejudice. And the one thing he says about organization, if someone can do a job and do it well, doing without corruption, keep all the parasites and detractors away from him and let him do his job. That's still true. That's still true. Every time you want to do a job for black people, all the detractors and everybody come around. But everybody wants the front position yes. for the washing of the ego, oh, yes. but not for service. No. Yes. We suffer from an untreated disease, yes. ego starvation. We are longing for the front position because it makes us feel powerful but does not assign to us the responsibility of power. That a free people must be a responsible people. A free people must be an honest people, must be an uncorruptible people. I could have done many other things with my life. I've never had a fortune or yarn for one. I don't think I could manage one right now because I don't think I can find enough people I can trust to help me manage it. I never owned a car because I can't park very well and besides public transportation was so accessible to me when I had my full vision that I didn't see the necessity of owning a car. And just at a time I thought I would buy myself a little Honda just for my, because the family car was always gone or being used for other reasons. 
Well, nature, circumstances so fit to begin to extract my eyesight. <laughs> I could have sat down and cried. I could have lived on my little pension and social security. But I realized one thing, my greatest facility was still there with eyesight you can analyze and observe. And I was good at observing audiences and observing classes. And, and I could tell when there's a dull light in the student's eyes. I'm not to sit and blame the student. I'm not to call him dumb. Give me three weeks I'll put some light in that eye. I'll put some knowledge in that head. <laughs> I can't time a motor. Can't even mix a decent drink. But I can teach. And I know. Let me do what I am most able to do. Let each one in our struggle do what he's best suited to do. Yes, yes, yes. And do it well. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to turn the administration, the clerk work over to someone else. But when it came to the analysis and training researchers, and that's something I've done well. I never strive for any great degree. I taught 50 years. I like in one semester in finishing grammar school. I trained so many students in PhD, helped to write PhDs, until soon after I began to have difficulty with my eyesight, answered a letter from University of Pacific, a recommendation from one of my students. But my students informed them that I've taught all these years without a degree of my own. And they asked me, would you want to enter program and get your degree? So I entered the program. It took me all the credit they give you for things you've already done. It took me a year to get my BA and two years to get my PhD. Now, I did not know one thing more with the degrees <laughs> than I knew without the degrees. Because getting the degrees, all I did was something I was doing all along. Now, I did it in a formal way and wrote a paper about it and laid out some research schemas and got the, the degree. People are still saying that, well, you know, you can't depend on him. He, you know, after all, he is a semi-literate, you know, he never, he never actually finished grammar school. <laughs> I don't even tell them any difference. I'm going to close out this by letting you know my main peeve at this juncture in our history is that we have not read documents enough. We have not read books enough. We've not done enough in analysis. Samuel Cardin, who just came back from Mauritania, new information on the Arab slave trade. I had shopping bags for before he left. People in the South discovered that I wanted material. They sent me two more shopping bags. I got material debates from the House of Lords 
on the slave trade, testament by those who participated in the slave trade, doctor's thesis written about, about some of his victims, some we met in England and, and especially in the conference in Manchester. So I don't debate about whether it is or is not. Colonialism was a form of slavery. Neo-colonialism is a form of slavery. The TV set is a form of slavery. Now, I wonder, can you take this? The Bible, improperly used, is also a form of slavery. Now, that means that I'm against the Bible? No. I'm as spiritual as anyone else. But I question the intelligence of anyone who thinks everything in the Bible is true or supposed to be true. One of the main reasons they haven't translated the Dead Sea Scrolls because if you translate them properly and understand what they're saying, you have to change the whole thing around anyway. Then you got to make a comparison between the Old Testament and the New Testament, so-called King James Version. Version is an interpretation. Man has changed, especially Europeans, literature of the world to suit the sickness of their ego. Now we can cure the sickness of our ego by getting serious about serious things. That does not mean we got to take laughter from our life, love from our life, enjoyment of our children from our life. In fact, we're going to do it better once we understand better. All my life, I have been in love with something or somebody. The somebody sometimes had made out as well as I wanted to. But the something has never failed me. The something is my commitment to African unity, yes. to truth wherever I can find it, yes. and understanding that those in a fight for your liberation need comfort and protection because they are human beings yes. and that so much pressure can break any human being and you cannot judge people who change under pressure until you've been under the same pressure and failed to be broken. So you've got to have some kind of mercy and consideration. Now let me end where I began. When we look at South Africa, the special nature of South Africa, the whites enslaved Africans all over Africans and took them out. They enslaved South Africans on the spot. And so when they said they were fighting against apartheid, they were actually fighting against chattel slavery. They was fighting for emancipation. I believe with the legacy of a Winnie Mandela and the legacy of a Nelson Mandela. He is in charge of a holding action so that the real revolutionists can prepare. It's like Booker T. Washington shuffle, scratch when nothing was itched. Said yes when he didn't mean it. So that another generation can say, hell no. His sacrifice put up a school. The school is still there. What did you get for your shuffle? You still shuffling. You ain't got change for a dollar. <laughs> and he shuffled so 
you would not have to shepherd. When we understand the messengers, just the basic 20th century messengers, Booker T. Washington, Du Bois, Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, Elijah Muhammad. I don't rule out Elijah Muhammad. He was a semi-illiterate who created a kind of Islam that resembled real Islam less the mist resembles rain. And yet, his Islam communicated and created a Malcolm X who took it to a higher level out of which came a Farrakhan who could have taken it to a higher level instead of creating a con game around it. The commitment must be to the people and not to your personal ego. Farrakhan can sell one of his stretch limousines and see a black child through medical school. Did he have a right to, uh, to accept a billion dollars from Qaddafi or a promise of it? People give that money to nation, not individuals. Do he understand a religious state and that the worst crime that's ever happened to people has happened in a religious state in the name of a religion? Do you understood that Adolf Hitler was a Christian socialist? You got to understand history to get out of the way of the dangers of history and to guide your people through the obstacle course of history. But you can't go washing your ego at that expense. A true freedom fighter is a sacrificial human being. And the serious nature of being serious is commitment. It is like a relay race. You carry the baton around the field and pass it to the next runner, hoping that the next runner will do better than you, and the next runner after that runner will do better than that yes. until finally we find our way back home. And once you discover that you are a child of Africa, once you discover how to reclaim the land then the African state of mind can follow you wherever you are on the face of the earth. It is like a sun that never goes down. But you have to learn how to face the truth about yourself and the whole world and work toward making that truth into an instrument of your liberation. This, in essence, is what I mean about the serious business of being